I'm pleased to have with us today uh, Dr. Siegfried Glenzer, who is the recipient of the recent EO Lawrence Award and is professor of the high energy density uh, and, and division director at SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. He joined SLAC as a distinguished scientist in 2013 to build a new discovery class program in exploring matter and screen conditions using high power lasers and the world class Linux coherent light source X ray beam. Before joining SLAC, he held the Plasma Physics Group Leader here at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory for 12 years, where he led the first inertial confinement fusion experiments on the NIST ignition uh, on the NIST. He has also been visiting visiting lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley, and he is the individual recipient of, uh, of the American Physical Society Excellent in Plasma Physics Award in 2003. He also won two DOE Excellence in Publication Awards and two Science and Technology Awards. In 2004, he received the Alexander von Humboldt Senior Research Prize and spent a research and teaching year at the Universität Rostock at the Deutsche Elektron Synchrotron in Hamburg, Germany. Since then, he has been the host for two Alexander von Humboldt Lenin postdoctoral fellows, two Lawrence postdoctoral fellows, three Peter Paul Ewald fellows, and has supervised more than 30 postdoctoral scientists, both at Livermore and SLAC. He authored and co-authored more than 400 journal publications, and he's published the textbook Plasma Scattering of Electromagnetic Radiation by uh, with Fula himself, Luham Shafik, and he is a fellow of the American Physical Society. So the talk is, will be recorded, um, so if you're comfortable with that, uh, please log off, and uh, we'll please enter any questions you have in the chat field, and I'll read them at the end of the talk. And also just make sure everybody's aware this is an unclassified uh, talk, and um, there are people outside the lab. Um, otherwise, I wish to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Siegfried Glenzer, and I look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. Uh, good to, to meet everybody this morning. Of course, I don't see you, so um, Hopefully this goes all right. So this morning I talk about exploring the most extreme conditions of matter with ultraviolet X-rays, and you can see in the background the, the, our um, accelerator at uh, SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Here we produce the world's brightest X-rays, and um, this is of course the theme of this talk. However, the, another X big X-ray facility is of course at Long Zoom or Lab uh, for 19 years. Just as a postdoc and then moved up the ranks. Of course, this is the other big X-ray facility I'm still closely engaged with the program, and I'll show you data about it as well. All right, so when I came to Slack and Stanford, the, the idea was really to think of um, our field of high energy density science as a as, as a as a as its own field in physics. And what we wanted to to study were basic plasma processes, extreme matter conditions, and material science from a basic perspective that is relevant for fusion science. Now, of course, this, the, all the themes are very challenging and are very exciting to work on. For example, in basic plasma science, we want to do experiments that we can test particle and cell simulations that predict novel accelerators, in particular study instabilities that lead to high energy cosmic rays. And of course, the particle and cell simulations are worth um, testing with experiments. There are issues of convergence and, and um, issues of large-scale simulations where you have to make approximations, and it's of course super interesting to, to experiment, and I'll show you examples of that. In extreme conditions, you're interested in, in, in um, studying the conditions that approach burning plasmas, and of course those are extremely dense systems, and I'll show you many examples here. And here our goal is to test the density function theory to, that's important for alpha stopping and for plasma heating simulating burning, um, um, burning rays. And the issue with uh, DSC simulation is the exchange correlation function, which has normally been tested in solid state physics. However, there are better functions out there for warm dense matter and for, for hot dense plasmas, and I'll show you an example of how we, how we go about those. And finally, in, in fusion material science, the, the, the big challenges are the atomic interaction potentials that are used in molecular dynamics simulations. And just to give you an example, when we studied the, the melting of, of uh, tungsten, and we had people making uh, simulations for us. We, we asked them, you know, let's do it blindly. We'll show you the data after you know, the simulations. And when the simulations came in, 
the mating times were even in the, in the, in the ballpark. The, the, the predicted 700 picosecond, and we, we found you know, times of 20 picoseconds after laser heating. And of course, um, our collaborators are uh, pretty competent, so what they did, they, 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 they looked at other uh, interatomic potentials, and they found one that actually nailed the data. So in that sense, it's really important to do it these experiments and to, to make progress to testing our models that then are used to, to predict even more extreme conditions. So all this works well. And as I told you at the beginning, I will talk about LCLS experiments and I talk, I will talk about NIF experiments. And of course, there was a lot, a lot of success and, and um, high impact publications came out here in 2020 to talk about the new methods to, to measure visibility of species, in this case, carbon and, and hydrogen. And of course, we started this office two years ago with diffraction. Now we do this extra Thompson scattering and the, this new paper out here. A lot of this talk will be dedicated to that. MVC has also been used to study structural evolution of glasses and liquid silicas. And then, you know, of course, there's a the NIF discovery science um, allocation. And Andrea just published a paper in Nature where she studied um, uh, conditions that are important to the interior of white walls. And I will talk about this also in more detail. Federico published this paper together with High Soup Park and the, and the um, original shock um, um, collaboration. And they have actually demonstrated the first order Fermi acceleration process in the laboratory. So all this is pretty exciting, lots of, lots of high impact papers. And of course, that's why we are thinking of, of our field now as, as its own field in, in, in science. And, and the challenges are listed here. We, we, we want to, um, Explore material and matter and plasmas at pressures above one megabar. That means you have to understand the genesis, strongly coupled plasmas, non ideal plasmas, radiative and relativistic plasmas. And of course, one of the big goals of our field is, is to create a burning plasma to create ICF and maybe eventually fusion energy um, in this compressed matter. So, and of course, uh, these are exciting times. Just a couple of days ago, there was another neutron record on the list. And um, so my understanding is that the pressure was, that was achieved was about 300 gigabar and 150 kilojoules uh, of fusion years, so which is about 10% conversion from lasers now to fusion energy, so which is quite exciting. And all that happens when you have a, when you start as a liquid cryogenic ET and you compress it along the path to get to this point. And I think there's the, the there's not a lot of excitement in the field to, to push the boundaries further. So let's just compare this real quick. So um, let's compare it to, to, to jet plasma. So magnetic fusion plasma is about 0.1 gigabar. And actually, atmospheric plasma, we got a high density. They get to pretty high pressures. It's quite interesting. So there was this APS in my talk by Peter Brueggemann. So, so it is interesting, but still, this, this is really the most extreme case that we, that we want to go. And of course, we've done some very cool experiments, and one of them is shown here. So we, we start to compress about two megabar in this, this regime, 200 gigapascal. And there's this paper by Dominic Krauss, and actually what we discovered was diamond rain. And um, because it's connection to Neptune, that has received extremely wide public attention. So that discovery wasn't here in the news and was picked up in some um, at National Geographic. And by close to a thousand websites that people talk about mining diamonds on that tune and they want to spell it. Um, but why is that important for us? We know that um, from NASA observations that Neptune emits more radiation than it receives from the sun. That means there's an internal process going on that generates heat. And the idea here in, of this model is that we have, um, we have uh, carbon and, and hydrogen in, in the mantle of Neptune and they're no longer miscible at high pressures. That means the um, carbon is forming diamonds, maybe big ones, and they gravitate to the core. And as they, as they, as they move through the planet, they generate friction heat, and that's, that's the idea of what they're observing here. So it's, so it's um, a pretty exciting process. There's still detailed modeling that needs to get done, but, but, but it, it was pretty exciting to, to see this data. So then we pushed it a little further. Um, when up in pressure and density, and actually at that point we reached uh, conditions um, on the interior of bone dwarfs. And actually, bone dwarfs are some very recent project uh, objects that were first discovered in 1995. 
And of course, um, these are important to determine the total mass of stellar systems. This, the, as we recently in research 20, 229b, there was also the potential of a, of a life carrying super Earth in the brown dwarf binary system. So here's an example of a brown dwarf going, going um, or passing by another object. So it's quite cool to study this type of material. And the reason is that there's dynamo activity, which is much stronger than predicted. That means the conductivity conditions in inside the planet are different than all our models are saying. And we happen to study these conditions, and I will show you much more about this um, at, the, at the very end of the talk. But what you can see here is an excitonsal scattering signal in the collective regime, and you see actually two plasmons, a downshift and an upshifted plasmon. And the upshifted plasmon can only occur if there's energy in the system. So that theme will, will, will come again. So just remember, that when a photon interacts with matter, the photon can always give momentum to the, to the material. And that's known from the Compton uh, effect uh, since, 19, since the 1920s. However, if the system is hot or it's in the warm dense matter state, also the inverse can happen. That means momentum can be transferred to the, to the photon from the, from the plasmon in, uh, inside the material. And that's why the intensity ratio must be inherently temperature sensitive. And indeed, this is it's re simply reflecting the boulder function. So it's e to minus h nu over kt. So this is a way to measure temperature from first principles. And once you know that, then and you have an estimate of the, of the connectivity, then you can really test your model. And um, as I said, we will come back to this uh, later. So, so this was a, a, a big success. I already mentioned that we that we also studied uh, white dwarf condition um, the, uh, this is the NIF discovery science. And of course, this is pretty pretty important for um, to to um, understand um, the lifetime or, or the age of certain galaxies. When, when, when the sun stops burning, it just um, falls into a white dwarf, and then there's a hot ball that sits there emits radiation and, and slowly cools off. So from, from the light curve, you can then infer um, the, the age of galaxies when, when you look at them um, with, with, with a calibrated um, measurement detector. So people have done that, but people have done, done more about this. Let me first tell you how we do this experiment. We do it in the backlighting mode. You see your you ball at the center uh, of a nipple one. Then you have zinc helium alpha x rays <coughs> to backlight um, a spherical shock wave that's converging on the axis. And here you can see the shock wave um, going, going along. This is time, this is radius. So now you have two, two measurements. There's the velocity from simply from, from following the, the trajectory. You also have the density from, from the attenuation of the x rays to the material. And, and now Um, am I still online? I can hear you, Sikri. Okay, very good. Okay, there was some some um, interruption. Okay, very good. So, so we get the pressure. Now we can plot the pressure as a function of compression. And actually, what we see here, 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 the data. These one published by Tito two years ago. This one from now from Andrea um, last year. And you can see that. Um, Theoretical models that include the detailed atomic structure can uh, agree very well with the data. So it's, it's, um, we have now a system, uh, an equation of state um, that is well tested against experiments, which is of course important to, to model our white walls. We also see that simpler atomic atom models like this one here is not uh, agreeing well with our data. All right. So why is that so exciting? So it's not only cool to to look at the at the um, at the age of galaxies, um, white dwarfs are also the progenitors to type 1A supernovae. And of course, they have been used as standard candles in the expansion of the universe at 2011 Nobel Prize. That was giving rise to dark energy. That means that the expansion of the universe is, is, um, is accelerating. So, so why are white dwarfs standard candles? It's because they're, they're burning the pictonal nuclear limit. And that means it's, it's only density dependent. And um, when some mass is accreted to, to a white dwarf, the, the white dwarf goes off and starts to burn again and um, cause a, a supernova. 
and they always start in the same way and um, and explode. And that's how they can be used as standard candles and the burning of cops carbon, as most of you know. So this is a, a, an important um, area for for white dwarfs. So uh, and the connection with slack is, is is not only the experiment and and and, and um, the X-ray diagnostics and X-ray capabilities that they're using, but there's also um, the Vera Rubin Observatory, where we're actually installing the world's biggest CCD cameras to make a survey of the southern hemisphere. And there we will, of course, try to observe um, all the supernovae that go, go off and also look for gravitational lensing. That's, this is also studies of dark energy and dark matter. So there's a very nice connection here. So let me talk more about Slack. Of course, most of the extra experiments are done um, using the LCLS. This is essentially a two-mile long atomic scale camera with 10 to second shutter speed. Of course, photon energies are now, um, uh, most of the experiments have, have been done um, in, in our field at around 10 kilovolt, but very soon it's at 25 kilovolt. X-ray pulse length is now below a femtosecond, so it's an auto second regime. Most of our experiments are done with 50 femtosecond resolution. Benefits, typical benefits here of uh, 0.1 to 2%. However, I show you that you can do it much better. It takes some effort, uh, but it's worth it, and um, it's an excite, exciting new development. Of course, your petition rate is 120 hertz, so that's where we, uh, that's mostly relevant for us. That's where we get the high energy X rays. The 1 megahertz capability that is also being built up um, uh, may, may only be used in, in, in a, a minority of six months. Of course, the machine length is uh, roughly two kilometers, and um, we've seen this before. This is a this is a um, analyzer hall. We have a, a high current electron beam going going through, through the, the alternating magnetic field, so that the, the electrons start to wiggle. They emit radiation. Now the, the current density is so high and the, the emission is so strong that the, that the emission is actually modifying the electron beam itself. Forming to micro bunches, and all those micro bunches um, are starting to coherently emit radiation and producing the work bias X ray source. So, why is that? In the X ray regime, you can see this is how an annihilator looks like. And it's like, a, you know, the distance here is about inches or a couple of centimeters. However, in the, in the frame of reference for the atom beam, which is going at 40.8 GeV, of course, this distance becomes of all angstroms, and that's why you have angstrom radiation or, or hard X rays. This is all cool. This was 2009. I've been researching on the machine, of course. Uh, it was the, the, the brightest X-ray source <coughs> um, on the planet. So it, it was many orders of magnitude higher than synchrotrons that, that, that were um, operating at that time. And of course, um, others also switched on their own Fiaton lasers in uh, Japan, for example, and Flash. But then but for a while, that took the, the, the brightness, peak brightness records from us. And then we had a paper in 2015 with Luke Fletcher that about cell seeding. And uh, that's the highest peak brightness point um, that I'm aware of. So I think this is still the world record in, in terms of peak brightness. And it does matter for our field. The peak brightness is essentially the parameter to turn the signal to noise of all exponential data um, in dynamic compression. All right, so LCLS is, an, is a user facility. It operates 24 hours a day and it's 95% beam availability. It's open to all of you. You can all write proposals and um, you, you get peer reviewed and you have um, ch a chance of access. So this is how it looked like 10 years ago. This is how it looks now. By now we have replaced the underlayer with a very good gap underlayer. So now we, we, we can change the gap in a way that, that we can approach 25 kilo electron volts. Operation has begun in, in, in September 2020, and we are hoping that uh, by September 21, or maybe later in the uh, in the fall, we will actually demonstrate 25 kilowatt volts. On the left hand side, you also see the underlayer for the, for the megahertz capability that is also, that is also being built. So this is the most recent picture, and of course, this came came about in a big collaboration. I should probably mention that with a lot of laboratories. Play important roles in putting LCLS2 together and, and, and enhance the, the, the national X ray capability. But the bottom line is that for us and for our field, it all comes together at the, at the meta and extreme condition instrument and the NEC target chamber, which is a Titan or um, uh, a Titan target chamber. So, so we, we know it's been um, 
a very successful chamber that's been used in high power laser experiments. And of course, that's what, what we're doing here. We're bringing together the world's widest X rays with high power lasers. And um, for those of you who have not been at NEC, this is a little video that here it shows the entrance. They go inside into the tunnel and then you go underground. And then you can see people bringing up an experiment. It's actually cryogenic jet experiments because that's why that it's a scaffolding. And here you see our human scientists and, and um, uh, collaborators bringing up X-ray detectors and spectrometers. So I told you here we are connecting X-rays with, with, with high power lasers. The, the, the capability of those lasers is, is uh, very moderate, but it's still exciting um, to, to, do, to do science here because of the, um, the X-ray capability. So we have moderate, moderate short and long procedure, as I said, and we can use our X-ray beam, we can focus it. And we can, here's an example of 10 micron focus, we use barium compact lenses. They actually shown in most standard experiments a one micron focus, and we can actually get it down to 150 nanometers. So you have extremely high resolution. You can also produce multiple pulses. Here's a, here are two examples, I will address this in a second. Um, just want to, to mention here that we can, we, we do most of our experiments with 50 femtosecond pulses, and we can measure that simply from the loss of the electron beam, energy loss of the electron beam, that of course then goes into, into um, X-ray photons and uh, determines the, um, the, the pulse length. So as I said, this is our facility and we have a, um, a strong R&D program to, um, to do first-class science with moderate laser capabilities. And here's an, here are some examples. So as I said, this is the fastest spectrum that was done earlier. Since then, we have developed seeding to put more photons in the more narrow X-ray benefits, and that, that's how we get the high peak brightness. We then started to work with, with, with our accelerator people, and um, LCS is a three gigahertz instrument, so we can fill up to eight buckets with electrons, and then we get them all to lace. And here the, here's the, the first demonstration of that. And um, this is this is a so-called pulse train, so it gives you eight pulses is down to 350 picoseconds. At the moment, we've demonstrated that in 1.2 nanoseconds, but the people are working hard to get it, to get it to to sub nanosecond um, time delays. And of course, this is important because once you have this capability, we can we can study material as it as it progresses through the high energy density science phase space that I showed at the beginning. And that means is that your experimental data are no longer dependent on the details of the initial conditions. So if you study a material with defects, the defects will always be different from one target to the other. But now you can actually study it for one particular defect, how it behaves as you're compressing a heat unit. The same is of, of course too for, for other um, targets that have unique initial conditions. So we are pretty excited about this, and actually people uh, collaborated in Sevilla and Livermore also think that this is important, and, and they have um, brought us the Icarus detector that allows us to, to, to start up experiments with four um, pulses, and Ariana Wiesman and, and, <coughs> and her collaborators have already uh, started to, to do some experiments, and they are more scheduled uh, later this year. Of course, uh, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we, we are dependent on, on having good simulation capabilities that not only give us theory for the experimental data, but also help us to design the experiments. And uh, Fredio Capuza is, is, is running this effort here at Slack, and he has shown the simulations and use of big computers to, to, to get this done. And actually, it's quite exciting that they discovered a new instability, nonlinear instability that, that was presented on, I think yesterday by, by um, Ryan Peterson, and he actually won the won the poster award at, uh, at the NISGF uh, user meeting. So this is quite exciting work that's going on. Finally, uh, uh, one more example. This is um, the novel terahertz capability that we have um, been developing. I will show you some of the data um, from Zhang. These are data from, Brian, uh, from Ben Afori Okai, who led the first successful MEC experiment. This is new capability. And that was actually the first experiment during the pandemic. So it was very challenging. People were with masks and social distancing and only reduced manpower, but uh, you got it to work. So, so, so the ID program is, is vital and is progressing well. 
And let me show, show you how we put it to use. So, of course, you have a target holder here somewhere. We put X-ray detectors around it. As I said, we have like gigawatt laser powers, so not, which, which is um, still remarkable because it means that every human on Earth will hold a laser point to the same spot. So this is about the power that we put on those targets. And, and then we have detectors around it. So the X-ray beam is coming in. Oh, oh sorry. So, um, of course, it, let me first tell you that we are using this, this is to compress material to isochronically heat it. And here's an example where the lasers um, ablate materials. And, and, and then the compression, of course, is, is understood through so Newton's third law of actual equal reactor. So now we use our X rays, we fire on our targets. And it, you can see uh, the, the signatures and the detectors. Here you have the, the, the brush bearings here, extra Thompson scattering, forward and back scatter. You can then put all this information together and for a cold aluminum target, long and behold, we recover the structure of aluminum just like in a textbook. Then, of course, you do pump probe experiments. They need to heat it, we compress it, and indeed we see first the compressed solids and we see the phase transition, and then we, see, we measure the conditions um, in, in bond matter. So, the, here's an example of when we compress plastics. That was a, a, Study that Dominic published a couple of years ago. And uh, long and forward, when we use a, a, a shaped laser pulse, we actually see the diamond one on one diffraction peak. And that's made out of that's, the initial conditions are plastic. So as shown here, this is our, this is our ambient condition. And as we are compressing, we, we reach a certain pressure state at low enough temperature so it does, um, that we get the right conditions. You can see that the diamond one on one. And actually, as the material falls apart again, you can see that the diamond, this compressed diamond, and falls back to ambient diamond. So, pretty exciting. That, and here's what we believe is going on. You have the ambient polystyrene. The first shock wave rips it apart, and then the second is um, increasing the, um, the pressures further. And then carbon and hydrogen is no longer miscible. And then what that means is you form diamonds, you also form mixed regions, and very likely you also form metallic hydrogen where you only have hydrogen. So it's pretty complicated. Of course, this one, this is still under investigation in um, these simulations. So let me move on. Actually, in December 2020, again, this Dominic, um, as, a, as a PI, he, he performed a remote experiment at MEC. There's mostly um, people in, in our team, local team, people here. Um, actually, in doing, doing the work on the ground, and the people were still communicating through the bean time to get this done. And what's exciting about this one, now we use from two species to three species. And the uh, oxygen, it's, you still see a very strong one on one diamond uh, formation at the right uh, conditions of, of two megabar. So you can, you can make it very complicated. And uh, of course, this is a new discovery that just came, came about. So what we do with this data, we, <coughs> we, we test our equational state and we, we test our understanding of phase, of, um, you know, phase transitions and um, of high pressure phases. So this is the range that we actually see diamond formation. And if you were just going along the Hugonio, we actually never saw it. There are some early experiments that people have seen it, but that's probably not because of, mis of a miscibility effect that was probably of an of a, of, of, an, of a long time effect on the experiment, the hydrogen was just leaving um, uh, the system. So it's pretty interesting. So, so we got it, we got it only into these, into these, um, in that phase space. But what is the big weakness of all this? The pressure we got it from Visa, but there's no independent temperature measurement here. It was inferred from uh, from modeling and from some of the structure factor measurements. So. One, one of our goals was actually to start developing first principle temperature measurements that works in the warm dense matter and dense plasma. <coughs> so somebody needs to needs to um, mute his uh, phone. All right. So here's uh, our development of of first principle temperature measurements, and we do it with exotons together. Uh, most people call it IXS, and this is like the reason is. Well, they call it that way, they, they cause a very small bandwidth of tens of millielectron volts. That means we come in with our, with our um, 
XOB, which is already fairly narrow, which is seeded to 0.5 EV bandwidth, but it's not enough to resolve a, a phonon or an inacoustic base. That means we have to clean it up further, we bounce it around crystals, and we get the bandwidth down to, to tens of milliatron volts. And actually here you can see an example of, of, on a test on diamonds that results the phonons. However, that comes at a price, right? The SATA beam, that means self-amplified spontaneous emission of radiation, gives you 10 to the 12 photons. If you see it, you're down to 10 to the 11. Now you have to monochromize it, now you're 10 to the 10, and you only get um, 10 to the 4 scalar photons out of it. So that means you want to analyze as many photons as possible. That means you build this huge uh, crystal analyzer. That, that cover a large uh, solid, solid range, solid area. And of course, then we have 10 photons roughly here at this analyzer. And then we focus this back to our detector, so we're down to one photon. So, so that um, system would not work in, in a single shot, but of course, we were lucky and we developed cryogenic jets. As shown here on the right, so it's a continuous source. We started with this argon. We, we shock compress it with an optical drive at five hertz, and then you, the, you look at the data, and you can see here the instrument function, you see the, how the experimental data grow out of noise. And um, that's, that's um, a way for us to, to make this measurement work. So we need like 10,000 shots to, to, to have a nice spectrum, as shown here, those are observation, here's the fit. And again, you can see that the shoulders have different intensities. It will become uh, more apparent later on as another picture. But you can see this is again the principle of detail balance. And that principle of detail balance allows us to measure the temperature uh, from first principles. So, um, so we not only asked you to trust us, we actually went to, to the European Excel in Hamburg and we did an experiment <coughs> where, we, where we studied um, the inacoustic modes in, in well controlled temperature conditions that are actually here's a solid. Diamond at room temperature, and then we heat it up to 500, 500 Kelvin. So, <laughs> and um, you can see that as the, as the system gets hotter, the intensity goes up, just as predicted. So, the theory is right, we trusted it anyway. But now we have an experimental demonstration, and that came out in scientific reports. 18 accounts, one of our students um, published that to, together with Emma McBride. All right, so now you have that independent temperature or, or first level temperature measurement, you can now use this. Um, to, to really near um, the HED phase space. And here's an example that we plot temperature as a function of time. And you can see uh, um, this for first demonstration, the quality of the data was, was, was fairly acceptable. All right, so these are, this is a little summary of, of the diagnostics that, that, that come about just by thinking about combining powerful lasers and X-ray light sources. And here's, here is the temperature measurement that I just mentioned as function of time, but you can see the, how the asymmetry is evolving. And it's fairly nice, so this, this is the iron feature. Putting this back into context, that means X-ray transfer scaling is not fully analog to optical transfer scaling. So when I joined Livermore uh, like, um, in 1995, I, I worked in, on ICF, and I, the first thing that, I, that during my postdoc I developed um, optical transfer scaling in ICF plasma. And we did forward and backward scattering, and it has since then de developed and evolved. And Dustin Fuller and others are, are, are now doing this experiment at, at Omega, and, and actually now continue to be performed um, or just starting up on this as well. So the, now that the optical Thomson scattering is established, they're now establishing extra Thomson scattering. So they actually get the electron feature done. We, have, we can measure plasmons and Compton scattering. Plasmons and forward scattering, compton and back scattering. I show, hopefully, I get time and show you a couple of examples. And now you can see here's the ion feature. We've done the collective one, the ion acoustic waves, as shown here. Just recently, there was another um, MDC experiment with Bob, Bob Naylor and Tom White and, and collaborating with our team. And they actually got the first signature of non collective ion feature data as well. So we are now bringing, bringing this capability up to its full potential. So it's a, it's quite a success story. Um, I mentioned the terahertz stuff already. I also want to, to mention the high pressure water data that, that Mungo first published. And actually, what we've done, we use a uh, differential dynamic microscopy. So, what you do, you look at the bonding mo motion of suspension of, uh, of suspended nanoparticles or nanospheres in, um, 
that's in just regular water or uh, due to rigid water. And you can see we extended the, 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 the viscosity data all the, out, all the way out to higher pressures. And of course, this was a proof of concept and is now being pursued with access at LCLS and, and um, it's also done with collaboration with LED and people um, collaborating with Ariana who want to do this. So I mentioned terahertz already. Terahertz is a, is a pretty important capability to study connectivity. And this plot kind of illustrates this. So if you had only had optical connectivity data, and you use the one from um, DJ and Chen that was published here, and if you then use this data and extrapolate uh, back to the DC connectivity, you get the dash curves. So they end up somewhere here for sigma, some some, some modeling. Um, you know, the, independent of the modeling, you can see this here and this is curves. However, you don't know if that's right. So now we have terahertz data that just recently, um, was re the paper was recently accepted and the terahertz data sh are shown here. So now, if you have both sets of data, you can get actually the theory, theory curves that gives you the right connectivity, and we know it gets the right connectivity because we have one four-point measurement here um, for a solid foil and to get the right answer. That means if you want to know your DC electric connectivity, you better do it in the terahertz regime. And I think we heard a talk yesterday from Ben um, at the user meeting that, that demonstrated that. All right, so let me just show you this um, plot here. So there was a controversy on one lens aluminum, and I think for, for some people this is still ongoing. And there were, there were papers published that, you know, the connectivity in one aluminum should really be this curve. And um, there was some pretty strong language in those papers. And we, we of course, think that the, the papers are wrong. Here were our data and um, simulations. And um, those are uh, published by Bastian and so on. And actually, Ben just delivered this terror of connectivity result. And so it's shown here. So it's pretty nice. But apparently, this is where almost everybody agrees at this data point. So for some reason, this must be the, the point that is most easily measurable or most easily calculable. So of course, you need to go to higher temperatures to, to, to really distinguish between these models. But for sure, we can distinguish between that model and, and, and all of those. And um, that was published in in um, in a comment in the WB two years ago, and I encourage you to read this. Um, essentially, what, what this series used, they used the wrong structure factors. And we know that because we have experimental data that measure the structure factor, and, and that's why um, these papers were wrong. And um, also, we, we clarify some of the typos that, that are in the literature. And so, so if, you're, if you're interested in connectivity, this is a good paper to, to read. So of course, those papers um, are pretty important to us because um, it, it shows that that HED science is X-ray lasers is, 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 is a strong field and, and it's advancing um, advancing the science. So and here are examples of that. And of course, that has not gone unnoticed. It has sparked significant international effort. And it already mentioned that we've done an experiment at the European Expo, the HED instrument. And of course, you know, this has been commissioned you now two years ago. And uh, this is um, a, a three and a half kilometer long accelerator that uh, this, this it starts in the city of Hamburg and ends up in a different state of Germany, and um, you, you do experiments here in, in, in this area. So another competition is, of course, Sakla in Japan, and, and there was already much talk about um, um, the capability in, in, that is being built in China. All right, so I talked to you, I mentioned earlier that we have um, fairly moderate lasers, and of course, all this competition coming up, we kind of use that to 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 talk about um, a potential laser upgrade um, at, at, um, at CLS. And of course, I was also motivated by this report from the Academy of Science, opportunities in intense ultrafast lasers that the Buckstrom shared. And it pointed out that, um, that the US is falling behind with its laser capabilities. And it had, of course, a recommendation to build at least one large scale open access high intensity laser facility. The good, the good thing is that this has gotten a lot of momentum because we had we had all those workshops um, bringing the community to LCLS, building up the science case, um, and of course Donna came to 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 MSC and also endorsed the, the idea to to bring a pedal lasers to MSC, 
And here's the, the example which we came up with. So we want to have a, a, a new case where we, where we have room for two target chambers, one here that where the extra beam needs the lasers and actually one another chamber where only lasers um, experiments can be done uh, on their own. And of course, we have to have a huge underground cave to hold our, all the laser capabilities. So that has been talked about a lot in, in this various community workshops and um, has, has been endorsed. And we're pretty happy about this. The Rogers Brighter Side Initiative and there was a, another CPP uh, event that just came out. So this is this has um, has gotten a, a, a lot of momentum, and we're presently preparing for CD1 this year. And here's what we want to build: we want to have a pedal laser with 150 joule, 150 femtosecond that operates at 10 hertz. And of course, the idea is to produce bright sources of ions and neutrons, magnetic fields, and study fusion plasmas. And um, Compared to, to the competition I mentioned earlier, this is this is um, gets us um, quite far. And at the same time, we also want to build a compression laser to to get further in, 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 the, um, in compressed material science. And here we're talking about a kilojoule laser that gets that shoots in a short minute. And of course, the idea is to produce extreme states of matter uh, near isentropic conditions. Maybe get so unearthly materials. All right, so. This all fits in nicely with the future vision. This is uh, the accelerator. This is the, the fire experimental hall set. This is the, the present MEC is located. We will move a little bit further to the right um, and build a new new cave for the MECU for the MEC upgrade. It's called MECU. And actually, if we if we do this right, when LCLS becomes uh, or expands even further with multiple analysis and instruments, we may have a chance to co combine these lasers actually with another actually. So this is all exciting. So this is a future um, a vision, but actually the future is already here, right? Because we now have 25 kilowatt X-rays, and 25 kilowatt X-rays allow us um, to to measure the pair correlation function in in a dynamically compressed system. And um, we have predictions for, in this case, for shock compressed aluminum. And that can only be done at 25 kilowatts because you need to cover enough inverse angstrom, um, uh, inverse space space, I think, to 10 inverse angstroms in, in order to, to make an invert for the pair correlation function. Also, interestingly, if you go to a higher energy x rays, you get higher resolution in your x ray detectors. That means you can push down the resolution potentially to three to four milliatom volts, an order of magnitude that present stand. Of course, that will be very important to, for studies of ion acoustic waves in, in dense plasmas. And finally, we do, we, so far we have only done experiments up to five hertz at, um, at MEC and in, in a, in a um, pump probe setting, lasers and x-rays. So, and we are now developing new targets, and hopefully we, we, we can we can take full advantage of the 120 hertz X-rays. Um, at, at UED at LCLS, we actually have just demonstrated 360 hertz, um, but at, at sub milliatom volts in a pump probe setting. Of course, our goal is to go to push the limits here. Okay, let me give you one uh, one final example why all this is, is exciting and cool. You know, this is a this is a measurement where we an LCLS measurement where we done um, Thomson scattering in um, in solids. The paper here that shows how that works. So this is now an X-ray Thomson scattering um, signal. You get the elastic scattering at 9.2 kilo electron volts, and now you get the downshift of the Compton feature. So the Compton feature is simply the, the X-rays um, give momentum to, to the electrons, and, the, and that's why they downshift the energy. And actually, this feature here represents um, the electrons that are in the metal. Right? This is barium. And it allows us to actually um, have a look at what is the best um, bound-free or what is the yeah, bound-free scattering spectrum or, or model to, to, to fit the spectrum. And we have two choices here. One is the Epsilon rule, one is the, uh, the RK rule. The bottom line is you can always get the intensity ratio right. But the fit down here is best if you use this type of normalization. And so now we have, we felt like we are confident about our bond free scattering model. That means those are electrons that are bound in the solids. Now we can also use it for one dense matter. So 
This is the same spectrum. I just moved out. This is 8,400. This is 9,200. So notice it shrinks a little bit. And now we overlap the extra Thompson scaling data from this. So it was taken by Tilo and, and, and others. And you have make three observations. First of all, the, the, the content feature is very broad. The inelastic scattering intensity has changed. And you can see there are upshifted photons. And you now remember what I said earlier, you can only get those if there's energy in the system. So, and of course, this is now a very sensitive measurement of the electron temperature. And this is shown here, so Luke has done, has done this bit. And you can see that um, since there's no bond free scattering overlapping in this regime, that, that you get a very nice estimate of the temperature from, from this regime. And our fits show that the temperature can be inferred with an error of less than 10%. So those are um, states that, that, that are deep in the Fermi sea. And what is happening is, in order to give the photon some momentum, that electron has to be promoted down. However, if it's Fermi degenerate, it cannot go down because all the states are occupied. So only if there's finite temperatures, there are states available, can, is it possible for the, for the electron to go down. And that's why this is a nice measurement of the electron temperature. All right, so this is this is um, quite a remarkable observation. We can now look at at the at, at the Compton feature itself. The Compton feature is traditionally giving us the electron density. Uh, it's mostly sensitive to that because they are near degenerate regimes. However, in our case, we now find that the area and density is the largest because it still overlaps with, with the bond-free spectrum, and it's about 25%. So now we can also look at the ionization state, um, or at the elastic scaling that gives us the ionization state. And um, here we get, again, errors down to 10%. So we can put this all together, and we find this. So this is our Thompson scaling spectrum. This uses our, our um, f sum rule normalization, so this is our best fit. And it actually does matter what normalization you take. So this, the blue data points are shown here. And if you use the, the other normalization, the, the data are lower um, when you plot Z or the ionization state as a function of, de of density or of compression. So this is um, it's, it's, a, it's a nice finding. And what's particularly interesting is that, that um, Max Schoener, Mandy Max Benhagen, and Ronald Redmond that did the density function theory, and they found these are these curves. This is the, those are DFT results, brand new at 150 eV for this density range and, and here for 100 dB, and lo and behold, we observe much better agreement with the DFT if we use the right normalization. Of course, this is still work in progress. The analysis has been performed by, by Luke, Max, and Tito, and, and others. However, the, have in mind that this assumes a single temperature density ionization state condition. And this is a, a, a compressed barium, and that cannot be true for all times. Um, that there must be a, eventually there must gradients must occur probably late in late in the experiment where a single condition is no, assumption is no longer valid. However, this seems to be pretty well fit with that with that assumption as long as it's maybe close to peak compression. Compression, and what tells us that this is a, a good idea is the fact that we can also look at the forward scattering plus months at very similar times, and again we can do a fit. And what we find is that if you, if you do this if you, if you do the modeling, that the 30 degree data agree nicely with our backscatter data. So that that is valid validation that the, this procedure is, is is doing very well, and it actually includes electron ion collisionality in the one learning approximation, which works pretty well in, in this case, and actually overlaps with the DFT. So this is pretty cool. And actually, now, long and behold, if you're interested, here's what other people would predict if they used to acquire the echo And of course, there may be some overlap, but essentially those models don't, are not really applicable once you go to the, these very extreme case, cases. So of course, it's, probably I should conclude with, with this one, um, with, with this slide or with this vision, because what I fear is that um, HED is a really exciting, fast-moving field, and it's a really great time to be working this field at this point in time. So when I get up in the morning, I'm excited to to, to check my email and I'm excited to think about everything because of all the opportunities that, that, that are being 
presented to us. And the last experiment that I showed to you, uh, um, I talked about shock compressed matter, X-ray Thompson scattering, um, where Mike is actually now developing a, a new platform to get very homogeneous conditions for for, for um, X-ray Thompson scattering condition. And, and Amy is now doing, um, is leading the new Gigabar experiment. And of course, what we want to do here, we want to study um, again, conditions in the interior of white dwarfs, and we want to finally want to see this swing, which is predicted for liquid oxygen um, at pressures that we can access on the mission. So this will be exciting to test. That test has not been, this observation has never been done, and, I'll show, and of course it tells us a lot of how energy goes into shock waves. And um, this is a feature of L-shell ionization. This is a feature of K-shell ionization. And what that means, as you're ionizing the air shell, the K shell, you can put more and more energy into the into the, into the um, shock. However, once it's all ionized, it all falls back, and eventually you reach just regular 79 limits of rho or rho naught of four. So that will be exciting to see. So we are, there's a discovery science experiment out there. I want to point out there's also the NIF diagnostics program out there, and of course George and, and Stevens are now building up the three omega and five omega Thompson scaling, scaling capability. The three omega Thompson scaling was already used in the collision of shock experiment of FUSA. So now five omega Thompson scaling is next, and actually they just got it to work, and they saw the first time an electron plasma feature at five omega. This is just a, the very first piece of data, and of course this will be a very important tool to study whole worms. So finally, speaking of whole worms, one day I was I was um, preparing a lecture for about fusion. And looked at John Lennon's book, and I saw all those pictures, these whole ones, this, this shield in there. And I was wondering, why are we not doing any experiments on the NIF that has LAH shield? So I asked Peter Ament and, and Dennis Sinkel and others, and we came up with a, with, with, with a um, proposal in the NIF Disruptive Initiative, and Alistair Moore um, is now the PI. And, um, we believe that this is worth a very cool test. And what, the, what we believe what will happen here is that the asymmetries will be reduced. And also the shields will, will provide more drive onto the capsule. And we get like, that's an additional 70 terawatts in drive. So it's very exciting. And of course, all the physics eventually should come together and we, we should be able to, um, to, to, to get to the goal of this field to, to demonstrate fusion in the laboratory. And, um, so it's exciting, exciting um, times. So I think we are taking full advantage of the field by using the world's largest facility. We can now provide insight into structure factors, related field generation mechanisms, and the evolution of other physical bodies. We will produce a fusion in the, in the, in the laboratory. I'm confident of that. And um, we may have to work hard to get there, but I, but I think there's, there's, this is um, this program will, will succeed. And um, along the way, we will make new discoveries, right? We, we already discovered in the diamond rain, we have data on ultra fast melting, and we developed novel accelerators. We've developed all types of new techniques that I've shown you from X ray scattering to terahertz to an acoustic base. And of course, the upgrade of the, MEC, the laser capabilities of MEC will, will be very important to advance the field and, and to continue to making these type of discoveries. With that, I should, of course, thank all the people that, that um, fund us, particularly the Office of Science, Fusion Energy Sciences, is the FWP that, that has got all this started. And now, of course, we have other agencies that fund um, students and, and um, um, give us money, uh, LDID money, to, to, to advance the research. I thank you for your attention. I thank all my collaborators shown here. If I've missed somebody, I'm sorry. This, those are always the hardest side to make. All right, so that, thank you, and take your questions. Thank you very much. A very nice talk. Uh, so please enter your questions in the chat field. And also, I would welcome everybody to uh, unmute yourselves so we can give Sikri a, a great big applause. We've already got a question from Eric Schwigler. Uh, it says, nice talk. Can you comment on any data science challenges needs when doing experiments on LCLS? Yeah, this is of course um, an important question. And it, um, 
as I said, we, do, we now do five hertz experiments. We will do eventually 120 hertz experiments at high excellent energy. But, but essentially, once you go to megahertz capabilities, the challenge is, of course, to have detectors that work in, at, at a megahertz. And there's a strong program, detector development program, that's left to, to put these detectors in place. However, then those data need to all be moved to a supercomputer, and this is, there's a collaboration with NERSC, and um, there will be a connection made there to to have to have some data analysis performed on on a supercomputer. And um, for, for what it matters, there's of course a strong strong effort in machine learning to to um, to, to analyze this data in you know, without without humans being with a human just observing, not humans doing the work anymore. So that that's being being developed. It's of course it, the people that do experiments at a megahertz are, are pushing the limit here, and and we, we will probably learn a lot from them and and um, to advance our our capabilities. Are there any other questions? A question from Ivan Olyanik. Uh, it was a very nice talk. I have a question concerning temperature measurements and shock compression experiments. What are the limitations of the technique in terms of materials, types, metals, insulators, transparent, opaque? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I think it becomes obvious. Um, so if you, if, you, if you look at this, so you. So I told you that if you do a first temperature, first principle temperature measurement, you must look at the at the intensity ratio of the Stokes and anti-Stokes lines. That means of the downshift and upshift of the plasma, and they are only sensitive to temperature if the energy, the frequency shift or the energy shift is of the order of the temperature itself. So now here you, you see an energy shift of a few hundred dB. That means you can measure temperatures of a few hundred dB nicely, and this is shown here. You get the results. So now if you go back to an acoustic base, which is okay. shown here. So now what is happening is um, we're, we're doing this on, on shock compressed solids. And the shock compressed solids are only of the or, are less than one eV. The pressures are higher, they are megabar and beyond, but the temperatures are only ten thousand Kelvin or five thousand Kelvin. So now you need to have an energy shift that is of the order of 5,000 Kelvin in order to use the, 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 the balance. And that's why we need the higher resolution instrumentation to make this work. So, um, and that's why these, these systems work um, in, in terms of, you, you have to bring the right diagnostic to the right problem. I think that this is what we have done here. So um, these experiments are done in argon. Um, the goal is to uh, we, we, the goal is to do it also in Krypton at higher higher Z and I think that will actually be easy because higher Z species scatter more. The challenge will go to low Z species, particularly to hydrogen, and um, that's why the high rep rate comes into play. And we believe that um, we will have a science program to make that happen. There's another question from Eric Schwegler. Uh, for the pulse train capability, not sure I understand how this reduces the effect of initial conditions on the target. Can you say more about this? Yeah, so if you have a, say you have a solid and you have a defect at a certain location. So now, um, and you want to observe how the shock wave goes through and potentially gets amplified and moves further. So if you, if, if you do this measurement with one defect or with a number of defects, and you want to, so you want to make that observation, if you, if once you have shot that target, the target is gone, and you have to replace it with a new target. So the new target will have that defect at a different location. The defect may have a smaller radius, so maybe deformed, may just look just very different. That means you, you you can never put together how that system evolves because every target will have slightly different initial conditions, and that's actually true for almost all experiments in high energy density physics. Every lift target is different. When people talk about I, got, I, will, um, I will reproduce my, my shot on this. They're always kidding themselves because the next target 
has a different um, dislocation density, has different craters, has different pits, and it's a different initial condition. So repeating the experiment can only happen in an approximation. And so for that reason, this capability is important because you can, you don't, you're not, not dependent on the, on, on the repeatability of the targets. There's a question from Ming Sheng Wei. Excellent work. Can you comment on developing and bringing advanced probes, uh, like protein, X-ray, and particle to big driver facilities? Oh, so that's just the right slide. Um, so I think Chair may be actually one of the um, one of the first things that you that we will bring to a big facility. So we so we've already done terahertz laser probes and with FEL probes. So we've done we've done that experiment at, at daily uh, produce, uh, terahertz we produce an accelerator. However, the laser probes can can be transferred to an HED facility. And uh, Ben has started to do this, and he has done the, uh, started to do this at, at Jupiter Laser Facility. So you shock compressed material, and then you use a terahertz probe to measure the, the shock properties. And of course, with more and more success of this technique, we believe this, will also, this can also um, be used as, as, for example, Omega or this. So this is one of the ways that we um, can go there. I could give you more examples if, if, <laughs> if, if you like, but you should probably do this offline. All right, so Ivan Olenek would like to have your perspective on merging NIF compression capability with precise X-ray diffraction at MEC for LCLS. All right, so there is already a, a diffraction capability available on this. That was actually developed um, within the discovery science um, um, arena by Ray Smith and uh, John Eggert and Luke Collins and so on. So and they're already taking great data. There was a nature paper uh, coming out um, just recently on, on short compressed iron on this. So that capability exists. It does have much bigger bandwidth uh, and not, not as good. And it's, the time resolution is, of course, different. So bringing an extra laser to NIF is hard. And I know people have jokingly spoke about this many times. Um, but people have thought about ac accelerating electrons with lasers and, 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 and perform an under, uh, have an under laser there and, and do this type of X-ray diagnostics. I, I'm not sure if that's um, if you are really ready to talk about this seriously. So um, that's why at the moment what we are trying to do, in particular at the MET upgrade, we want to build lasers that can that can um, shock compress ablators that are being used on this, like the diamond a diamond ablator, into the right pressure regime. That means you need to get to 10 megabar and beyond. Then we can study the physics of a diamond ablator with LTLS extra precision and um, test our models and learn what we can and then feed the information back to, to the NIF programs. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Siegfried. Um, it's been great having you here. And I wish everybody has a great rest of their Thursday. And let's uh, unmute again and give uh, another nice round of applause. Thank you.